Hello, uh, welcome. I'm joined here today with Matt Eagleton. He is the uh, Chief of Vascular Surgery at uh, MGH in Harvard. He's been there for about 10 to 11 months, so relatively new end of the job. Uh, he moved there from Cleveland Clinic, and we're going to spend some time just finding out what makes Matt tick. Great. Uh, we, he gave grand rounds this morning, and we acknowledge the important role that Rochester had played in the development of leaders in vascular surgery. And so I know that you started your professional life there. So I'm very interested in what is it that makes eCenter so successful in creating people who really develop the future of the specialty? I think at the time it was it was the mentors who were there who took an interest in the residents, took an interest in the medical students and getting them involved. Um, my exposure actually began as an undergrad. I, my grandfather had gotten ill and was taken care of by Jim DeWeese. And uh, Jim DeWeese was rounding on him in the intensive care unit and he and I began having a conversation at that time. It was probably my first introduction to vascular care. Um, and then when I was a resident, a, a medical student, um, I began working with some of the residents who were interested in vascular and they ended up being big names in vascular surgery. So Roy Greenberg, Carl Illig, um, were some of the, the junior residents who ended up being in research labs with at the time. And then as my interest grew, then I became more exposed to the faculty who were Dick Green and Ken Oriel. And uh, they ended up playing significant mentorship roles amongst all of us and persuading us to go into vascular surgery. I think at the time we also recognized uh, their dedication to the evolution of vascular disease. They took a real interest in a real promotion of the endovascular era and uh, made opportunities available for residents and fellows to get trained in endovascular therapies. And we recognized, I think early on, that that was going to be a significant portion of our care in the future. So you started life there and then you moved to Michigan and then you ended up at the Cleveland Clinic. Obviously mm -hmm. Cleveland Clinic is an enormous program, had been tremendously influential and in particularly in the evolution of aortic surgery. Yeah. Tell us about Roy Greenberg and how that program evolved. So Roy, uh, Roy's interest in aortic disease actually began as a fellow and I think some of his ability to achieve what he achieved was just the people he met along his training. So. Dick Green had set up an opportunity for the fellows in Rochester to spend some time in Malmo, Sweden and work with Akrasi Ivanchev. And Krasi at the time was a pioneer in sort of endovascular aortic therapies. Akrasi uh, was working with Cook Medical at the time and then Roy became introduced to members of Cook Medical and uh, most significantly John DeFord and they developed a significant relationship so that when Roy finished his training program, went to Cleveland. Um, my understanding is Cook wanted to do something different with the uh, deployment of a clinical trial and tag Roy to potentially be one of the leaders in endovascular therapy for EVAR as they look towards developing their clinical trial. And that's how he, he gained a foothold in development of the, of the technology and it was also an area of interest in his. Um, I, Rochester early on had an interest in endovascular therapy and the research of endovascular therapy. When I was a medical student there, Tim Tudor mm -hmm. was a fellow there as well and already was doing research on the development of endovascular grafts while he was a fellow. And so I think we were all just exposed to it during that period of time as well. But it became part of your DNA. It did, it did. So it's, even though the evolution hit everybody else mm -hmm. later, later, it was already part of our, our understanding of what the future of vascular disease was going to be. All right, you made a big decision recently, and that is to move and take over the leadership reins of one of the premier institutions in the country. I did. Tell me the challenges. <laughs> <laughs> the ones you can't tell me you about. You said this no. is only 10 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> um, it's always hard. You know, it I, is very hard to move. You yeah. know, I, the, the few big challenges for me. One, I was, had a very established practice, a very established research program, and to suddenly say, we're stopping this completely, and moving it somewhere else, it was a tremendous challenge and I probably underestimated the difficulty in doing that. We have been successful in doing that, but it took almost a year. Yeah, it's interesting. I always think about, you go back a little bit, but you have an opportunity to leap forward yeah. and establish your own program. I guess in some ways, in, nothing against Cleveland, I felt a little stagnant there, that I've mm -hmm. achieved what I could achieve there and if I wanted to challenge myself, challenge my program, challenge my thinking, I needed to be exposed to a new environment. And certainly Boston provides that to me. Now you work with your wife. I do. You have a very unique situation. <coughs> there are a lot of husband and wife surgical teams who are probably watching this saying, you guys seem to make it work remarkably well. There are actually several in vascular. Yep. So mm -hmm. uh, me and Sunita, Sunita Srivastava is my wife, uh, uh, Mal Sheehan and his wife, 
uh, Tim Shooter and Jade. Um, I know there's another couple out there, I think, that are in the New York City area in, in private practice. I don't know their names, but um, not so unique for us. You know, when you spend all your time in the hospital with the same people, um, ultimately relationships happen. So when the nanny doesn't turn up first thing in the morning, <laughs> who stays home? Yeah. The, the kid comes to work. <laughs> yeah. I think our, our son knows uh, more about vascular disease than maybe some of our interns do. Who are oh my in, gosh. So. Well, well, speaking of that then, we're going through this new change in the vascular world, taking uh, medical students straight into an integrated program versus yeah. in the past, you did five years of general surgery. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then going to vascular fellowship. What's your early thought on the, on the integrated a, program? I think it's a phenomenal opportunity, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very supportive of it. Uh, in Cleveland, we have the, the privilege of having both programs and running them in parallel. And I, I say running in parallel because they, they're considered two separate programs. But the reality is if you're going to have both, they integrate with each other, and they, they feed off each other, teach each other, and complement each other, I think. Uh, and I don't think we should get rid of one over the other. I think those opportunities ought to exist for people who've done general surgery and want to seek additional uh, training in vascular surgery. Um, my view of the d trainees is they're very different as they enter the program. Um, obviously, the, you enter it just out of medical school, you don't have an, a f great knowledge base or experience in treating patients, but once they get to, say, the fourth year, where we're starting to treat them equivalent to a fellow, the vascular residents are much better at endovascular skills, in my observation, and much better in their understanding of vascular disease. And that's because they've been exposed to it in a much more intense fashion than the, someone who's in their general surgery training. The general surgery residents, though, are better at identifying and managing patients that are, are critically ill and potentially doing open operations, although that may be starting to fade now as open operations are disappearing in the general surgery field as well. Um, by the end of the program, they, they start to equilibrate with each other, though, and I know within a, at least a year of practice, there's probably no difference between the two groups. I yeah, don't know what your experience is no, with that. I think it's, we, it's very similar. We run both of these programs. I really don't want to be excluded from hiring the person who laid on decides they want to yeah. do vascular surgery. So, you know, our experience is very similar to what yours is. We finished a couple of the integrated residents and they've been superb, actually, yeah. beyond what I really thought we were going to be able to achieve. So I think both programs can work. Um, you know, the, like you, the increase in concern is open operative skills, particularly yeah. around the aorta. And, you know, how are you going to handle this? I have been privileged to be in institutions where we have a plethora of aortic disease, and so our ability to, and we provide a, a widespread of aortic care from complex aortic disease to complex open aortic, endovascular aortic disease, complex open aortic disease. So I'm not concerned about our trainees in Boston. I certainly wasn't concerned about it in Cleveland, about them getting experience. I am concerned about it, though, at other smaller programs where they don't have an aortic center or they don't have that focus of aortic disease. I suspect those trainees will struggle to get aortic training. Um, I don't know how this will change over time, whether we will have to have centers of excellence within the country where people go to get trained in aortic disease. I, I suspect that's going to be true. Or there will be fellowship programs available in aortic disease for people to get additional training that they lack. And we, we had an aortic fellowship in, in Cleveland. And once we uh, have a more established program in Boston, we're interested in doing it there as well. So you teased us at the end of your presentation this morning and new directions in imaging and navigation. Um, I think people are going to look back and look at how much radiation we got and think we were out of our minds and working in the dark ages. I don't think you have yeah. to pe wait for people in the future. I look at it now and say we're out of our minds to be exposing ourselves to this type of radiation on a continuous basis. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me that we find this acceptable. So it's interesting. I've had two opportunities recently because we do work with NASA, and one of the big issues in going to Mars is radiation exposure. Yeah. And so it's a huge <laughs> focus on radiation mitigation, both in our world and some significant parallels, although the type of radiation is a little bit different. And, you know, is that one of the things that's going to limit being able to put somebody on Mars? I mean, the kind of radiation that exposed. Once you get outside the Van Allen belts, um, the amount of radiation exposure you get goes up dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we've been working with them to try and figure out ways in which you can reduce radiation exposure. For example, one of the companies we saw, they actually would, they were really talking about massive radiation doses would protect your pelvis uh, because you need to protect bone marrow with stem cells yeah. to repopulate and you needed to identify where that bone marrow was that you could protect. So, uh, you know, I think the kind of work you're doing is, is, is right on. I think we, 
you know, and I, I think that our group is a bit forward thinking about that. I, what we need to do now is to continue to educate our own peers that they need to take this seriously and consider it, especially the younger people who are looking at doing this for their lifetime. And how can they protect themselves and what measures do they need to take so that they're not getting cancers or, or leukemias or, or the like over the course of their career. Or they're going to be forced to limit how long they can practice or at least practice endovascular therapy. One of the last times Ted Dietrich was out in public was here in the auditorium because I had him come to Pumps and Pipes and um, he did talk about radiation exposure and as you know there's a pretty poignant video that he yeah, actually absolutely. put together and he died shortly shortly after that but if that's not a wake up call for us then I don't know what Unfortunately, it is. Unfortunately uh, there's a large portion of the community and a large portion of the administration that don't believe it and say no no it, it's, it's not real. Um, including physicians and including people in the radiology field that say no you, this isn't a real event. Um, people aren't getting sick because of the radiation exposure, but um, uh, I guess I disagree with them, and I'm concerned enough about my own health and about my peers' health um, that I take it seriously. Well, thank you. Any anything you want to tell us? I don't what have makes any you tick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just I'm really passionate about aortic disease and about vascular surgery. I'm excited to have been a guest here in the Methodist Hospital today. And That's thank you very much for having thank you me. very much indeed for coming. Thanks. Thank you.